Hi, welcome to Astronomy 102, Stellar Astronomy Lab from the Community College of Aurora. I'm Dr. David Atley, and I'll be your instructor this term. Um, to start, let me just get this out of the way. Uh, you can call me Dr. Atley, you can call me Professor Atley, you can call me Dr. David or Professor David if you can't remember my last name. I'm not too choosy, um, so any of those will be fine. This video is going to introduce to you the syllabus for the course. So we'll be talking about what you can expect this semester in terms of content, as well as course organization, and how your semester grade will be calculated. So I'll briefly refer to this during our first live session of the term, but I am gonna rely on you to actually watch this video. Um, now, a number of you have had my Astronomy 101 class, um, last semester, so much of what I'll say in this introduction will be familiar, um, but do pay attention because some policies will have adjusted a little bit um, as I figure out what's working better in the CCA community. Before we jump into the course material, let me first say a few words about COVID-19. Due to the evolving Omicron spike um, over the last couple of weeks, policies regarding COVID-19 mitigation are changing as we move into spring. Um, so first, masks continue to be required in all CCA indoor public spaces. Because the Omicron variant is so much more contagious than the Delta variant, it's important to make sure that we're all doing our absolute best to prevent the spread of coronavirus within the CCA community. First, Unlike previous semesters, cloth masks are now out. So the college is requiring that everyone wear either a disposable surgical mask or even better, a KN95 mask. It's also important to make sure that your mask is covering both your nose and your mouth and that you have the best possible seal around your face. To do that, I'm going to take my mask, I'm going to apply it to my face using the ear loops I'm going to stretch out the mask to cover my entire face from my nose to my chin. And you'll notice that when I put it on, I squeezed this metal nose piece so that the mask is fitting tightly across the top of my face. This gives a good seal and limits the amount of puffery that happens around the outside of my mask instead of having my in-breath and out-breath go through the mask itself. Doing this also makes it less likely that my mouth, that my mask is going to slip off of my nose as I'm talking. Um, so it makes it easier to keep my face properly covered, and it means that I won't have to touch my mask as much or fidget with it to keep it in place. As you're wearing your mask, try to avoid touching the outside of your mask. And then once you're ready to take your mask off, remove it using the ear loops and dispose of it using a proper trash container. Also new this term, you must either have proof of vaccination, um, so that's two shots if you got either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, or the single dose of the J&J &J vaccine. Um, so you'll have to present that proof of vaccination or submit weekly testing results showing that you're negative for COVID-19. Uh, this is an attempt to mitigate the spread of COVID, um, and particularly the highly contagious Omicron variant within the CCA community to protect you, your families, your classmates, and the community more broadly. Due to the evolving nature of the pandemic, and especially, again, the Omicron surge, Policies are in flux, um, so please make sure that you're regularly checking CCA's COVID-19 mitigation page to learn about the most recent policies. Uh, one of those policies, for example, this term, which I hope uh, you all know, is that the first week this semester is going to be remote. Um, so we'll be doing remote instruction during week one and then go back to in-person instruction during week two to give us just a little bit more time to make sure that we have policies and procedures in place 
so that we can do our best to protect you and the community more broadly. If you go to the course D2L shell, you can download these slides that I'm using to give this presentation, in which case you can use that link across the bottom to uh, just go to CCA's uh, COVID page, or if it's before the start of term, so the D2L shell isn't available yet, you can go to ccaurora.edu slash coronavirus. Okay, um, so let's jump into the actual course itself. Now, again, for those of you who've had Astronomy 101 with me, these are going to feel familiar because this is still gen ed astronomy class, and so we're going to be covering a lot of the same broad skills, just with slightly different astronomical topics. So we'll still be looking at things like critical thinking, analytic reasoning, scientific process, and how we can use that scientific process in real-world contexts to develop new knowledge uh, with the goal of making you better consumers of science information and better citizens more generally. To accomplish that, we'll be looking at a number of topics across the discipline of astronomy. Some of these will be familiar to you if you've had Astronomy 101, uh, but this is not a sequence. Uh, so if you've had Astro 101, the beginning material of the course hopefully should be old hat for you and shouldn't be too much of a challenge. Um, if you haven't, that's okay. I'm going to be going over that material at exactly the same pace as I would in Astro 101, um, so you don't have to have any concern uh, that you might get left behind. So we'll start out the term looking at the night sky, how the sky changes over the course of a day and a month and a year. We'll connect that to things like seasons and then introduce some basic physics like orbits and the behavior of light. And those pieces of basic physics are going to be important as we continue through the rest of the term to understand what's going on. So it makes a lot more sense to understand orbits before we, say, try to use the orbits of two stars going around one another to measure their mass. Don't worry, we'll talk about how that works as we go along. Um, so we'll start out with that introduction to the sky and to some basic physics. We'll then look at our sun in particular, which is our nearest and therefore best studied star. And we'll use the sun as a jumping off point to understand other stars and the physics that governs their behavior. So we'll look at stars beyond the sun, we'll examine stellar evolution, we'll look at collections of stars as they come together to form galaxies. We'll also talk about this really mysterious, weird stuff that we're pretty sure it has to be out there called dark matter, and then we'll finish the semester talking about cosmology, which is the study of the universe on the largest possible scales. Um, so we'll look at the structure of the universe on big scales, how it got started, and where we think it might be going into the future. So that's the plan for this term in terms of topics. Let's now start looking at how the course itself is actually going to be organized. Before I jump into the nitty gritty, let me first pause to say that there is a written version of everything that I'm about to say available through the course D2L shell. There is a written syllabus that includes all of this material and the actual written syllabus is the formal contract between me and all of you about how I'm going to run the course and how grades will be determined this term. So if there's anything that you're not quite sure about, you want some additional information, check out the written syllabus up on the course page. And that written syllabus includes a detailed day-by-day -day schedule for how I plan to cover the material this semester. We may drift away from that schedule a little bit depending on how things go, and that's okay. Um, but I will do my best to keep the schedule so that you know what your reading needs to be and so you can adequately prepare for each coming class. Uh, you'll note that there are lots of colors on the image of the syllabus that you can see on the left-hand side of your screen. 
Um, so those colors code different parts of the course, so major due dates versus lab days or whatever. Um, there's also a grayscale printer-friendly version of the syllabus that's available if you would like to print out a copy of the syllabus and keep it with you. Um, I do encourage you to use the printer-friendly version if you want to do that so that the uh, different parts of the course that I've color-coded in the screen version actually show up properly color-coded again with different shades of gray. Okay, everybody always wants to know how am I getting evaluated? How is my grade going to be assigned? Your semester grade is going to depend on multiple different independent pieces that will all come together at the end based on the weighting scheme that I've outlined on the slide here. So this is a lab class, which means that you have to come to class. So attendance is the first part of that scheme. In addition to just coming to class, You'll also have a series of quizzes throughout the semester, both daily reading quizzes as well as less frequent module quizzes. Those will make up about 25% or one quarter of your overall semester grade. In addition, um, you'll have a series of labs that you'll complete in class that'll make up another quarter of your grade. There are not quite, but almost weekly homework assignments which will make up about a fifth of your grade. And then there are two long-term projects that will be due um, around one month in for the Constellation project, which makes up 15% of your grade, and then towards the end of the semester for the Stellar Evolution paper, which will make up 10% of your grade. And I'll talk about all of these different pieces in more detail over the next few minutes before we jump into all of those individual course pieces. Um, your textbook this term, um, some of you will be familiar with. It's Astronomy by Fracknoy, Morrison, and Wolf. Again, the Astronomy book is an OER, or Open Education Resource textbook, which means that it's free. Um, it's available for free on the openstacks.org website. It's also embedded in the course D2L shell, so you can actually read the book in D2L, either on the OpenStax website or in D2L. You can highlight and make notes, um, so there's very versatile annotation features available. And beyond that, you can also download either a PDF or an ebook version of this free textbook, so you can read it on your phone or in your Kindle if you prefer to read your book on the go rather than sitting at a computer screen. All of those are perfectly viable options. You can also get a paper version if you really want to from the bookstore. That's not free, you have to pay for that. Um, but if you're the type of person who prefers to have a paper textbook, that is also available for you. Okay, so let's now start talking about the actual policies and procedures for how the course is going to run on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, first of all, I expect you to come to class. Generally seems obvious, but it's worth mentioning. Um, however, I realize that life happens. It's not going to be possible for everyone to be in every class every day. So if something comes up, if you're sick, if a family member is sick, if you have a doctor's appointment, if you have some sort of an emergency, um, if your car gets stuck in the snow pulling out of your driveway, do your best to let me know that you won't be in class that day. Try to let me know ahead of time. Um, I try to be a little bit flexible, flexible about this. I realize sometimes things come up, but do me a favor. Try to let me know in advance so that I know you're going to be out. If you have a medical emergency, like you're in a car accident and you have to go to the emergency room, don't send me email. <laughs> Just go. If you have to see a medical provider because you've had a medical emergency, chances are they will give you some kind of paperwork, and that's all I need. So just show that to me when you come back to class, and we'll be good. Beyond those first two excused absences, I'll generally still excuse absences within reason as long as you show some good faith. So if you're going to, you know, let me know that you need to be out and why. Um, 
then that's okay. If you abuse the privilege, that's when there's going to start to be an issue. But as long as you're coming to class on a regular basis and letting me know that you're not going to be there and why when you can't be in class, I'm usually pretty flexible about this. If you miss a lab during an excused absence, that lab must be made up. And I'll encourage you to try to make up missed labs as soon as possible. The lab schedule is set up to sync pretty well with the course material. Um, so the longer you wait to make up a lab, the less benefit you'll get from it because we'll have moved on to other topics. Um, so do your best to try and make up the labs as soon as possible. And that has to happen outside of class time. So we'll have to make an appointment of an hour, hour and a half sometime out of the regular class time so that you can come and actually make up the lab. In addition to coming to class, you'll succeed in the course much better if you take some time prior to class to get yourself ready. That includes reading the assigned material before coming to class. Some of those assigned uh, reading, some of the material from those reading assignments will show up on your daily quizzes. And in addition to prepping for the quizzes, doing the reading will also give you the opportunity of noting things that you don't quite get and that you want me to explain differently or in more detail. And also, if you have time, take the chance to review your notes from the previous class, look at quizzes or labs that I've given back to you, look at my comments, uh, see what you got wrong and why, and if there's still something that you don't understand, make a note to ask me about it. I'm happy to go over and answer questions. I've alluded to your daily quizzes a couple of times already. Um, there's going to be a quiz at the beginning of every class. Um, it's going to last for 10 minutes or so. Um, and it's going to include three questions. Um, those will be drawn from the assigned reading for the day, as well as reviewing material from the previous class. Um, they're not designed to be super duper hard. I, it's really just a chance for me to see how you're doing and for you to see how you're keeping up, um, to make sure that you're grasping the material that I want you to grasp. If you show up late, you're going to get less time for these quizzes. So try to be on time for class so that you have the full 10 minutes to work through the quiz. Now, I will drop the lowest quiz. Um, so if you show up late and miss a quiz, or you show up with like two minutes left in the quiz so you can't really do a very good job, you know, these things happen. I'll drop that lowest quiz. Um, but if that keeps happening regularly, it is going to pull your grade down over the long term. So try to be on time and give yourself the full time to complete the reading quizzes. In addition to those daily quizzes, there are also four module quizzes scattered throughout the semester on major course topics. These are in place of midterms. Um, so we're not going to have midterms or final exams. We've got these module quizzes, um, which are worth you know, a few percent of your overall course grade, but they're not going to be as high stakes as a regular midterm. Um, that's the purpose of those projects that I alluded to earlier. The four module quizzes collectively are going to make up 35% of your quiz grade, which itself is worth 25% of your overall course grade. So I'll let you do the math on that and let you figure out how much each module quiz is worth. It's significant, but not overwhelming. In addition to the quizzes, there are also going to be regular lab exercises. Um, there are a total of seven labs in Astro 102, which means that there's going to be, on average, about one lab every other week. Now, that's on average. Um, there will be times where we'll go three or even four weeks without a lab, and other times where we might have you know, labs in back-to-back -back weeks, or there might even be one week where there are two labs. I'm not positive about that. I'd have to double-check the syllabus. Um, on lab days, uh, which are marked on the syllabus, please print the lab instructions and bring them with you to class. 
ideally, if you have time, you should read those lab instructions uh, before you get to class so you have an idea of what the lab's going to be and why you're doing it. And that's going to let you make the best use of the lab time in class so you're not having to sort of frantically read through the instructions and figure out what you're going to be doing next. Uh, also, just one quick note, don't print straight from D2L. Um, prior experience shows that this leads to formatting issues. So when you're getting ready to print the lab instructions, download the file from D2L onto the computer that you're working on and then print locally from that computer. Um, that'll get you the proper formatting and you won't get like weird stuff that can happen. So the D2L printing feature is weird. I don't know why, um, but printing locally works much better. I mentioned earlier that I will allow you to make up labs due to excused absences. But if you miss a lab for an unexcused absence, like you just didn't show up that day and never really said anything about it, that's going to turn into a zero. So try not to miss labs um, on unexcused absence days because uh, those zeros will add up quickly. But I will still drop your lowest lab grade. So if you happen to miss one lab, that's going to get dropped and that's not the end of the world. Um, but what it will mean is that if there's another lab that you struggle with um, because you're having a hard time with the material, the lab that you struggle with will then have to be counted. So again, try not to miss labs. And then we have one more recurring type of assignment that's going to be part of your evaluation, which is homework. Um, homeworks are going to be due mostly every week, um, and it's going to be always on the same day of the week. I believe um, for our course it's going to be on Tuesdays. Um, you can collaborate on homework assignments, and in fact I encourage that. It can be really helpful to talk with classmates and talk through homework questions. Um, but you all have to turn in your own individual answers to the homework assignments, um, which is not too surprising because the homework assignments are conducted through D2L, um, so you're not going to have to give me anything on paper. The homework assignment for each week will show up in the quizzes area on D2L. Um, so if you go to the quizzes area, you'll see homework one, homework two, whatever. Those are your homeworks. Uh, they're not quizzes, despite where they show up on D2L. I have to put them there just because of how the D2L interface works. I know it can be a little confusing. I'm sorry about that. Um, but so that's where your homework is. It's in the quizzes area on D2L. And once again, your lowest homework score will be dropped. That's it for the regular repeating parts of the course. But in addition to those recurring elements, we also have those two long-term projects that I mentioned earlier. The first is the Constellations project. Over the first month or so of the course, you're going to identify a constellation from a list that I'll give you in a separate project description and track the position of that constellation on the sky over the course of one month. The goal here is going to be to see how the motion of the Earth around the Sun leads to the movement of the stars on the night sky. Now, you're going to need at least 10 successful observations of your constellation over that month, and that means that you're going to need to plan ahead, because there will be cloudy nights and and this is important, the longer the baseline you have between your first and your last observation, the better you're going to be able to see the movement of that constellation. So the more precise your measurements are and the longer the baseline you have, the more likely you're going to be able to see those relevant motions and to characterize them correctly. Um, so plan ahead try and get started on the Constellations project as soon as possible. And then in addition to tracking the position of your constellation on the sky, you're also going to write a brief paper on your constellation. So that's going to answer several questions. The details are outlined um, in an accompanying project write-up. One of the things that you'll be doing, for example, is looking at the mythology attached to your constellation. Um, 
older constellations, especially ones that are very prominent, like, say, Orion, tend to have many myths associated with them. Um, so you'll write about a couple of those. It needs to be at least two. It doesn't have to be exhaustive. Um, Orion shows up across many cultures. You don't have to write about all of them. Uh, there are plenty of additional details, including detailed observing instructions, how to construct a position measurement tool. All of that stuff is available separately. That's the first project. The second, the Stellar Evolution paper, will be due at the end of term. Um, this is kind of in lieu of your final exam. Um, so you're going to take one star from your constellation. Um, so for example, if you choose the constellation Orion, you may choose the star Betelgeuse. Um, Betelgeuse is a pretty famous star. Um, I'm not going to spoil why it's famous in case somebody decides to write about that particular one. Um, but you're going to write a paper about that star. You'll describe what we know about the star and how we know it. Um, you'll plot it on a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Uh, this paper needs a bibliography, but it doesn't need to be footnoted. That's because there are going to be lots and lots of facts um, that are going to show up in this paper. And so you'd have to have like footnotes every sentence, and that gets to be too much. Um, so bibliography, but no footnotes. You'll submit your Stellar Evolution paper through a D2L Dropbox, the same way that you'll submit your paper for your Constellation project. Um, I think I forgot to mention that, but there will be a D2L Dropbox, and both of those papers will be processed through Turnitin to check for plagiarism. Um, so please make sure that you're writing your papers in your own words and not copying and pasting from sources or doing something silly like buying a paper online. Obviously, that's a no-no, as is copying and pasting. Okay, that's it for the individual parts that will make up your overall course grade. Let's now talk about some broader policies that apply across the course. Um, first, let's talk about late assignments. I do take late work in this course. Um, I'm going to take late assignments up to one week after the established due date. So if you have a lab or homework that's late that you just didn't turn in because um, you forgot or you got busy or something, I'll take that up to one week later. After a week, I'm going to post um, feedback and answers. So after that one week deadline passes, I'll stop taking late work. Um, there's an exception for this, which is your Stellar Evolution paper, because that's due at the end of term, so there's no time for late work. Um, but I, I will take everything else late with a penalty of 10% per business day. Um, so if you give me something one week late, that's 50% uh, credit, and then after that, um, I'll stop taking it. So, if we get to the end of the semester and you have a homework assignment that was due like at the beginning of the last week of class and then class ends, you don't get that full week. So anything that you want to turn in has to be in by 5 p.m. on the last scheduled day of class. If I don't have it by then, I'm not taking it because I have to start reading through everything and getting grades put together and I have a limited time window to do that. Um, so no late work past the close of business on the last day of class. CCA and all U.S. colleges and universities and businesses all have to conform to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And one of the things that we do in order to conform to that is to provide a mechanism for students who have disabilities to receive reasonable accommodations so you can still succeed in class despite your um, individual circumstances. So if you have a recognized disability that's been registered with the Office of Dis um, Disability and Equity, ODE, um, please contact me and let me know about that. Talk to me about what you need. Um, and in particular, if you need me to make a classroom accommodation, um, say you're hard of hearing and you need me to wear a wireless microphone or something like that, please talk to me as soon as possible so that we can get on that and that I can do my best to fulfill your particular needs. And then as the semester's going on, 
if you find that there's something that I'm doing that's not quite working, let me know. Um, I am a specialist in astronomy. I'm not a specialist in all forms of uh, disability and equity. Um, so if you find that there's something that's not working, talk to me, uh, and I will try to come up with a way that I can continue to best serve your needs. Uh, so this is a discussion between us about how we can best help you and get you through the course. On a completely unrelated note, uh, please leave your phones in your bags. Um, we all have these really addictive, distracting devices that we call mobile telephones um, that fit in our pockets. I completely understand how you could be fixated on the most recent game that you've got on your phone. Um, totally sympathetic. And the best way to avoid having that distract you during class is just to keep your phone put away. So rather than paying attention to your text messages or Instagram or whatever, if you focus on me or on your classmates or on your quiz as you're going through the class, you'll learn more, retain more, and do better overall. So do keep those phones put away, please. Um, and then also make sure that you've got your phones and other devices silenced. Um, so I am okay if you want to use a tablet or a laptop to, say, look at PowerPoint slides or to do other course-related activities. If you want to use a tablet to take notes or something, I know sometimes people like to do that. That's fine. Um, phones put away, other devices in support for classroom activities. And again, please make sure that those are silenced. I realize sometimes things happen if you know, your phone accidentally rings in the middle of class. I'm, it's not the end of the world. I, I might, you know, glance at you and then just carry on. Just do your best to make sure that things are silenced so you don't distract me, distract yourself, or distract your classmates. Okay. Uh, and then finally, uh, the part that I don't really like talking about, so I leave it to the end, is the academic integrity policy. Um, any form of academic dishonesty is prohibited in the Colorado Community College system. That can include things like cheating on an exam, but it could also extend to plagiarism or helping another student violate the policy. Um, that last one is something that oftentimes gets overlooked. All of those things strictly forbidden. And if I find that there's a possible violation of this policy, there is a specific procedure that I have to follow. I have to report it, and then we have to go through the process. Um, by far, the most common problem that I see show up is plagiarism. Um, plagiarism is what happens if you present another person's words or ideas as if they were your own. That can include copying and pasting from source material, um, can include replacing words in someone else's sentence. So if you paraphrase someone's idea without attributing it, that is also plagiarism. Um, quoting from sources can be important in certain contexts, like an English paper on a novel that you just read, or a sociology paper where you're quoting an important paper and then reflecting on it. Those are not things that you should be doing in this class. Um, so for astronomy, you should not be quoting directly from sources. That's not something you need to be doing for any assignment you're gonna write for my class. So quoting from sources, out, don't do it. This can happen in a number of contexts. Um, one common one is if somebody is struggling with a homework assignment, um, they may go looking on a homework help site uh, the example across the top of the slide here, I'm asking students from a previous class that I once taught uh, to explain the events leading up to a core collapse supernova. And then this particular student either didn't know how to answer that question or wasn't sure how to find an answer. Um, so he or she you know, went on the internet and found an answer from a homework help site um, and then just copied that answer and pasted it into their homework assignment and then that's what you're seeing in that block text um, sort of towards the middle of the slide. I'm not gonna just read that to you. You can pause the video and read it if you want. 
But this is the type of thing that you should not do. Do not copy and paste text. Um, so I think probably this student didn't just copy and paste, they typed it out, so there's some typos and stuff. Um, but homework help sites are a serious temptation to plagiarism, um, so don't use them. Stay away from homework help sites. That includes things like Quora or Chegg or Course Hero. Homework help sites have a couple of issues. One is the temptation to plagiarism, but there's also the issue that a lot of times their content is unvetted, which means that you could get a correct answer to a question I didn't ask. You could get a wrong answer and not know it. So stay away from those homework help sites. Talk to me, talk to your classmates, talk to tutors in the Science Tutoring Center if you need to, um, if you're stuck with a homework or a lab or something, um, but stay away from those online help sites because um, they often do more harm than good. As I said, if I come across a violation of the academic integrity policy, I do have to report it. Um, so there is a record that gets created with the college in the event that this happens. So at a minimum, you'll have to redo the assignment. Um, so how this works, if I find an academic integrity policy violation, um, I will arrange a meeting with the student in question. We'll talk about like what happened, and why, and what that student was thinking. And then based on that conversation, I'll assign what I think is an appropriate penalty, which then gets vetted by uh, the higher-ups who are my supervisors. Um, but at the very least, it's redoing the assignment with a reduced grade. Um, so it might go from an A to a B or a B to a C or something. More serious violations where if there's an entire plagiarized paper or if violations happen repeatedly so that there's a, serial, a seriality to it um, could incur more severe penalties um, up to and including from me, failure of the course, and under severe and very rare circumstances, this can include additional academic sanctions by the college up to and including expulsion. Um, I've never had that happen. I hope never to. Um, but I do have to tell you at the outset that it is a possibility. Um, so please use good practices when you're doing your homeworks and when you're writing your papers. Um, if you're not sure if something is acceptable, talk to me. I'm here as a resource for you. If you just want to like bounce off of me and talk about good practices, or how to conduct research in an ethical way. I'm here for that. That's one of the things that I can certainly help you with. Um, just be aware of what the policies are and the potential consequences. Um, and I always hope that this never happens. Um, there are some semesters where it does happen, others where it doesn't. Um, so let's hope that this is a good one and it doesn't become necessary and all of this warning was just words into the void. Um, so uh, I hate to end on sort of a down note, um, so I'll instead say thank you for watching. I hope to talk to you, all of you in class, both uh, in a synchronous remote fashion during the first week of the course and then in person uh, starting during week two. Uh, good luck this semester. I'm sure it's going to be a pleasure teaching you, um, and I will talk to you soon.